let's look at some examples of the matrix of derivatives. Uh, I want to start out with a function from R3 to R1. So this is a real valued function on three-dimensional space. Pretty simple function, x squared plus 2y squared plus 3z squared. Um, and not hard to take the matrix of derivatives. It never really is. Um, so df, or df if I wanted to explicitly say I'm evaluating it at xyz, which I often need to be careful about, is just going to be a 1 by 3 matrix, in other words, a row vector. Uh, that's just the derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So it's just going to be 2x, 4y, 6z. And as I mentioned in uh, another video, that's very, very similar to the gradient. The gradient, of course, is just a honest-to-God vector, like an arrow. 2x, 4y, 6z. Okay. And I want to take, just let's talk a little bit about why you would change perspective. Why, instead of using the gradient, you might use the, the row vector or the 1 by 3 matrix. That really requires, um, you know, further explanation to really get into why. But um, one one nice thing to, to note is that this matrix, this is the matrix, if you evaluate it at any particular point, let's say, uh, yeah, let, let's be really explicit. Let's say df at 1, 1, 1, just to be fun, 2, 4, 6. This is the matrix of a linear transformation. that goes from R3 to R1, just like our original map that we're trying to understand better and take the derivative of. So that's very, very suggestive. And that's really the deepest, that is a hint of the deepest meaning of the matrix of derivatives, is it's really encoding a linear transformation that is a linear approximation to this function. And if it's going to be a linear approximation to a function that goes from R3 to R1, it has to be something that goes from R3 to R1. And the matrix of something that has three inputs and one output is not a column vector. It's not a geometric vector. It's not an arrow. It's a machine that eats points in three-dimensional space or arrows in three-dimensional space and spits out numbers. And so there's a, a sense in which this is really a much better object than the gradient, even though the gradient has a nice pictorial representation as an arrow. Um, so one other thing about this particular example, as I said, there's much more to be said about that, but I don't want to belabor that point quite yet. Um, one other hint of some really nice uses of the matrix of derivatives, how would you understand this function? Not its derivative, just this function. Well, often you know, looking at level sets is a great idea. When you have a function with three inputs, you can't exactly graph the inputs and outputs together. You need four dimensions. And the level sets of these are, of course, ellipses, or ellipsoids. You just set this equal to a constant, and they're going to be ellipsoids. Um, and what we know, the gradient, of course, I don't want to diss the gradient too much. The gradient has a very nice feature, for example, that if you look at the ellipsoid that goes through 1, 1, 1, let's put 1, 1 out here, like that, then the ellipsoid that goes through there, not going to be too careful about it, this, the vector 2, 4, 6, is going to be perpendicular to that. This is a wonderful thing about the gradient and the relationship to the level sets that it's orthogonal. Okay, So it makes sense to think about, well, it, this row vector version of the gradient, the matrix of derivatives version, what's its nice relationship to that level set? And that's something for another video mostly, but I'll point out that there's one case where that's not an ellipsoid. If you set this equal to 0, then the only way you get x squared plus 2y squared plus 3z squared, squared equals 0 is right at the origin. That's a single point. That's pretty atypical. Usually when you have one equation and three variables, you expect a surface. You expect something that still has two dimensions you can go in the level set. And this is very degenerate. And what is the derivative there? df, oops, that's not going to work very well. DF at 0, 0, 0, of course, is the zero matrix. 
Now the, the gradient vector also would have told us that this is very special to be the zero vector. But this is a hint as to, oh, we might want to look at special things about a matrix, about the derivative matrix, to figure out maybe there's something special going on with the function or its level sets or other things about the function. Okay, so this is special and we'll leave it for later videos to figure out what is the right way to think about the, how that's special. What, in other words, what's the, the, the warning sign? What's the red flag in a matrix of derivatives in general that tells you something weird is going on? So, um, next example. Let me do one more example in this video and I'll, I'll do a part two um, with another one. Just as a bit of a contrast, that was a function from th with three inputs and one output. What about a function with one input and three outputs? which we often denote with uh, like a vector symbol over it because it, we think of it as a vector valued function. Okay, so that's gonna be like a space curve in other words. And uh, let's say the explicit example is uh, 5t comma cosine 2t comma sine 2t. Or I'm gonna wanna be, because I'm trying to be careful about row vectors versus column vectors and everything like that, I'm gonna write it as a column vector. When we think about matrices and matrix multiplication and linear transformations, we really want to make everything the, have the right dimensions. And this is one input, three outputs. I really should be writing it in this way. Okay. Of course, that's a helix. Uh, it comes out to us in, in the x direction, something like this, like that. I don't want to be too worried, too worried about the details. Okay. And what is its matrix of derivatives? Just put a big D in front of it. Uh, and of course, it's something that has the same shape as this, and that's why it's nice to write that as a column vector. And it's just going to be the derivatives. It's nothing more nor less than the velocity vector. You just differentiate all of these functions by all of the inputs. Well, there's only one input, so it's just the derivative, the ordinary derivative. And you get 2 cosine 2t. You just get the velocity vector written as a column vector, which is actually really how you should write it always anyway. So this is really, really nothing new. And so that's a good thing to know, is that the, the matrix of derivatives of a function with one input is just the usual derivative, the velocity vector of a curve, if you want to think about it physically. That's um, not really a new object, okay? But again, you want to think of this as, um, let's say if I took like dr at t equals pi, for example, that's going to be 5, uh, sine of 2 pi is 0, cosine of 2 pi is 1, so it's 2, okay? That, again, is the matrix, it's the, it's the velocity vector, but it's a very big hint that it's the matrix of a linear transformation that would, of course, go from one input to three outputs. So again, it's suggesting that we really should investigate the derivative as a linear transformation sometime fairly soon. But that's an explicit example uh, of the matrix of derivatives in this case. Note this guy, uh, this is never zero. Of course, this one, the five never vanishes at all. And also these guys never vanish simultaneously. And this is never zero. And that's related to the fact, another hint, that this is a nice smooth curve. This never slows down and stops and possibly has a cusp or some sort of corner or something like that. Um, so again, this matrix of derivatives not being too special, in particular not being the zero vector, um, related, is relating to something that's saying there's no degenerate points, there's no weird special points, no singularities. Um, and that's a really nice story that we'll continue.